So let's look at this. A 32-year-old male complains of difficulty breathing. He admits to smoking crack cocaine an hour before the problem started. You hear inspiratory strider and observe drooling. Final signs are pulse of 108, respiratory rate of 18, blood pressure of 142 on 88, setting at 95%. You should suspect. The dreaded you should suspect. Well, he's 32, has difficulty breathing. Picked a bad week to quit cocaine. Uh, smoked crack cocaine about an hour before it started. We have inspiratory strider. Strider is an upper airway sound. You observe drooling. We have some vital signs. Pulse of 108, blood pressure 142 on 88, satting a little low, but not horrible, you should suspect. All right, so I like this question because it makes you say, how would I know, right? You look at this and say, well, you know, you really have a, this is how registry rates questions, they're complex. There's three or four sentences and then you have to make a big decision, right? So agitated delirium, he's talking about smoking crack cocaine, he can't breathe, uh, difficulty breathing, he has strider and drooling, it's not agitated delirium. If this was a cocaine overdose, we often have very, very fast pulse, and a very, rapid, uh, very uh, elevated blood pressure, and this really isn't like that. And a cocaine overdose doesn't really cause drooling. So we're gonna get rid of that one too. We got rid of B and we got rid of T. So I have epiglottitis, and then we have laryngotracheobronchitis, right? And that is an inflammation of the uh, airways uh, from the larynx to the trachea. This is also known as croup. And this is an infection, not an irritation. Kids often have this, generally not adults. So what happened in this? The correct answer, which is A, epiglottitis, the epiglottis, the epiglottis, uh, the epiglottis uh, and the inflammation and irritation here, that that superheated air from the crack cocaine irritated as epiglottis. And what makes us think epiglottis more than anything else is that drooling. So in this, a 70-year-old male complains of difficulty breathing. So which of the following should influence your decision to assist his ventilation through the BVM? So when you're looking at this person, what would make you think that you'd have to be ventilated with the BVM? So let's say to ourselves, what one of these, now there's times that some of these choices might make you say, well, I should probably ventilate him, right? But in this, I think it's important to recognize that some of these things, while they could be indicated, are often, you know, compared with something else. Just because somebody has COPD doesn't mean you have to ventilate them. And just because there's an increase in the respiratory rate doesn't mean you have to ventilate them. You could get to a point with an increased respiratory rate that you have to ventilate the person, but those things won't do it. So now we have a decrease in the mental status or saturation below 90% on room air. So if you look at this and you say, well, which one of these? Now, could a patient have an oxygen saturation below 90% and not need ventilation? And the answer is yes. There are COPD patients in respiratory distress with saturations of 85 and 86 and you know, scary numbers, but they still have some respiratory effort enough to move air in and out, and we can give them a cannula or a non-rebreather and bring their saturation back up. The thing that's probably what's important and what a lot of you picked was that the decrease in the uh, mental status is a serious thing. So if you were to find respiratory failure, you would have a decreased depth of breathing and that you would have an abnormal rate of breathing, right? Now that rate could be high, very, very fast and shallow, or it could be very, very low, but you need both adequate depth and an adequate rate to have adequate breathing. And one of the things that you see when the patient's in respiratory failure 
is an altered mental status because the brain dysfunctions when it doesn't have oxygen. It needs oxygen. It's its primary fuel. There's not a lot of reserve left around in the brain. And that of these things, you could have all of the first three, A, B, and C, and not be in respiratory failure. But the decrease in mental status, what would influence your decision? That is the best answer of these ones that are given. So we're assisting the ventilation of a 17-year-old male had a severe asthma attack. When your partner assesses the patient's vitals, there's a significant drop in blood pressure. Which of the following is a likely cause? Okay. So I think many times you get questions like this, you don't know. So you say, well, what can I rule out? What can I do here that's different? So the question is, which of the following is the likely cause of his reduction in blood pressure? So hypoxia doesn't necessarily decrease blood pressure. Now, if we increase our preload, the amount of blood coming back to the heart, that could increase our stroke volume. And then obviously, depending on our rate, we could actually increase our uh, blood pressure if we increase the preload. Now, blood coming to the heart, our cardiac output might be higher. And well, that might raise the blood pressure, not do it. Now we have decreased VQ mismatch and increased intrathoracic pressure. Now the VQ mismatch, V is ventilation and Q is perfusion. We bring in a certain, air, a certain amount of air into our lungs. And when we do that, bring that air into our lungs. Um, we generally have a number of alveoli and uh, capillaries that are ready to exchange gas in the blood. Well, it's not a perfect match. Our body's designed to be pretty amazing and say, okay, if I take a good breath in, I'm going to have alveoli and they will exchange all that uh, oxygen for carbon dioxide in the alveoli. That's what ventilation perfusion is. And this uh, VQ mismatch is when there's a difference between the way it should be. Now, if we have a problem with ventilation, we are taking air in and out. But as far as the perfusion, that means getting blood to the capillaries to bring the carbon dioxide out and be able to take the oxygen on and return it to a cell somewhere in the body. So that, that ventilation perfusion mismatch is good, but what's going to cause a reduction in blood pressure? Well, the answer is B. The answer is increased intrathoracic pressure. Now, the reason that we have increased intrathoracic pressure is that if we look at our lungs, in our chest cavity, we have our lungs um, that come out like this. And within the chest cavity, um, we have our heart, which sits in here. And we have the aorta, which goes down and feeds the rest of our body. But we also have inferior vena cava coming up, which brings deoxygenated blood back to uh, the right atrium. And we also have blood that comes down from the head through the jugular veins that come in and do that as well. So what happens in this severe asthma attack, remember pressure is very, very important in our chest cavity because it's chain pressure that causes air to move in and out. If we overventilate and we increase the pressure in our chest cavity, we reduce preload to the heart. We reduce the blood that comes back to the heart because these low pressure veins, the vena cava here, requires our breathing in and out to help move that blood around. And that's called positive and negative pressure. If we only use positive pressure, we fill the chest, we increase the pressure, and that can reduce the amount of blood that comes back to the heart. And that's what causes the reduction in blood pressure. So the increase in intrathoracic pressure is the right answer because if we overventilate and we increase the pressure in our chest, that pressure is going to push on these vessels, which are in danger of collapsing, and that causes a reduction in blood pressure. So it's a little bit of a catch-22. We know that the person needs to be ventilated, but we can't overventilate. 
we do traditionally over ventilate in EMS.